same. You see, people choose to go vegan for one of three reasons. Their health, the animals, or the environment. But as for myself, I chose a totally different path. You see, it was the first day of college, and there was two lines, a hamburger line and a veggie burger line. Now, I went to a small university in New, New England. Now, on that first day, it was just freshmen, no upperclassmen. And they broke us up into small groups. And my group happened to be composed of nine women and myself. I wasn't complaining. But everybody was quiet, shy, nobody was really talking. And when lunch came, most of the women in my group went to the veggie burger line. And like a raging eight-year-old heterosexual, I followed suit. But I was not a vegetarian. No, I was a meat eater, carnivore, apex predator, top of the food chain. Look at my canines. But the woman in front of me turns around, looks at me, and goes, oh, are you a vegetarian? I looked and I said, I am now. I did not go vegetarian for noble reasons. But, and this is what's really important, the animals do not care why you go vegan. Your health does not care why you went vegan. And the environment does not care why you are vegan. All they care about is you're vegan right now. And seeing as how none of you are eating any meat, dairy, or egg product right now, congratulations, you're all vegan. So for the next 60 minutes, I'm going to give you some reasons why you should remain vegan. All right, so now that you know me a little better, I'd like to get to know you. So if everybody could please stand up, pretty please, with the cherry on top. Okay, now if you are vegan, meaning you choose not any flesh of an animal, no cows, no pigs, no chickens, no turkeys, no fish, and no byproducts, no dairy, no eggs, nothing from an animal, if you are vegan, please have a seat. Okay, okay, very good, very good. All right, now the rest of you, you're going to have to remain standing throughout the rest of the presentation. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody have a seat. All right, now, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Matrix? All right, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, there's a scene at the very beginning of the film where the main character is presented with two pills, one blue and one red, and he has to make a choice. If he chooses the blue pill, he falls asleep, and when he wakes up, everything will be exactly the way it's always been. If he chooses the red pill, he finally learns the truth. I'm here to give you that red pill. So, what does the Matrix look like? Let me show you. Now, despite what you might be thinking, these two circles are not equal. I repeat, these two circles are not equal. One is, in fact, larger than the other. What I need you to do is determine which one that is. All right, so please raise your hand if you believe the red circle is larger than the blue. All right, please raise your hand if you believe the blue circle is larger than the red. All right, very good. Now, before I say anything about these two circles, what was your first instinct? In terms of their size, they yeah, look the same. The reason why they look the same is because, in fact, they are the same. These two circles are equal. I got some of you to raise your hand and say they're not. So, what do we learn? That you can be manipulated like that to believe in something that goes against your natural instinct. And it doesn't take very much. Now, just imagine if as a child you were taught the lie that the blue circle is larger than the red, or that the red is larger than the blue, that lie becomes part of your reality. And if you say the lie enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. And if enough people are taught that lie, well, now that lie becomes part of the culture. And then if that culture passes that misinformation along to the next generation, well, now that lie becomes tradition. And we have to remember is tradition and morality, what we believe to be right, are not always the same. Can you think of any traditions that we once had that thankfully today we no longer have? Less than 200 years ago in the United States, slavery was a tradition. Less than 100 years ago in the United States, women weren't allowed to vote. And I'm giving you the United States because I'm coming from the United States. Less than 60 years ago, segregation was a part of the United States culture. But as we evolve as a culture, so do our traditions. So is our way of thinking. You see, the matrix is simply a story. And this story is being told again and again and again. In fact, if you believe the image on the carton is where you're getting your milk from, you're deceiving yourself. This is a fantasy. It only exists in your head. It's a blue pill fed to you by the industry to get you to buy their product. This is the matrix, the lie we tell ourselves about where our food is coming from. You see, the reality is far more disturbing. 90 to 95% of the milk, the meat, and the eggs that we consume are coming from these conditions. Now, this is called factory farming. This is where you take thousands of hens, pigs, and cows can find them into warehouses. In fact, every year in the United States, well, in the United States, I'm giving you those, those statistics, 
9 billion, right? 9 billion. Worldwide, 50 billion land animals, cows, pigs, and chickens are being slaughtered for food. So what that works out to be is every second in the United States, 300 animals are killed, just like that. So 300, 600, 900, 1,200. By the time this presentation is over, over 1 million animals will have been slaughtered. Being in Canada doesn't change any of this. So how is it possible that we can kill 300 animals like that and not think anything of it? Because of the story. You see, the story justifies the action. In fact, if you say it enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. Now, how many of you were taught as a child that you need to eat meat to get protein? I know I was. How many of you were taught you need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones? Cow's milk, not dog milk, not cat milk, not rat milk, not mouse milk, not elephant milk, giraffe milk, not chimp, not gorilla milk, not rhino milk, not hippo milk, not the milk from your own mother. No, you need to drink liquid secretions that drip, drip, drip from a cow's udder to get strong bones. So let's find out if the matrix is telling the truth. Now the first story that we've all been taught is that our diet is natural. Well, let's find out just how natural our diet really is. Let's take a three-year-old from any country in the world, put that three-year-old in the room, and line up five animals in front of that three-year-old. A pig, a dog, a cow, a cat, and a chicken. Do you think the three-year-old's gonna know which one to pet and which one to eat? What's the three-year-old most likely gonna try to do? Pet them all. The three-year-old's been told, no, 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 don't pet her. Eat her, pet him, love him. That's what we were taught. We did not choose our diet. Our diet is a learned behavior. Our diet was chosen to us by our parents based upon a cultural story. If we grew up somewhere else, we might be eating dogs and cats right now. But I guarantee you this, if we were given the choice as a child, none of us would be animals. Because no child wants to hurt an animal, and no child wants to pay somebody else to hurt the animal for them. Look, think about it this way. Put a baby in a crib. Put a right side of a baby chick, put a left side of a strawberry. Which one do you think the baby's going to try to play with? And which one do you think the baby's going to try to eat? Most likely, the baby's going to try to play with the thing that's moving and try to pick up the thing that's not moving, try to put it in her mouth. If the baby tries to eat the chick, what's the chick going to do? Yeah, peck, scream, run away. Now, if you walked into a room with a baby in a crib, playing with a strawberry and chewing on the head of a live chick, what would you think of that baby? You can allow that crazy, savage, psychotic, demonic, Satan baby to play with your baby. It's a play date. You see, if it's not a right for a baby to cause harm to an animal, even though they don't know any better, why does it become more acceptable as we get older? When we do no difference between a baby chick and a strawberry, and the question is, do we actually find it acceptable to cause harm to an animal? Let's find out. If you were to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a dog's head, what would you do? I imagine you would, you would intervene, at least show some kind of empathy, right? Why? Because you recognize it for what it is. It's animal abuse, it's animal cruelty. But what about if you were to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a pig's head? Would you not feel and do the exact same thing? And why? Because you recognize the similarities between these two animals and not the differences. You know these two animals are equal, just like you knew the two circles were equal. But all I do is tell you a story to go against your natural instinct. You know these two animals are equal. Every time you sit down for a meal, you create that inequality that doesn't actually exist. Now change the baseball bat to a butcher's knife. Change the man, the pig, from being outside to a factory farm far, far away. When it's out of sight, it's out of mind. We pay for that very thing we'd never want done in front of us. Look, think about it this way. Take two babies, one white, one black, put them in a room together. You think they care about the color of their skin? Of course not. So what do they want to do? They just want to play. So racism is a learned behavior. Nobody is born a racist. Hatred is something that is taught, passed down from generation to generation. We have been taught to view this animal differently from this animal. We have been taught to believe that this animal deserves to live and this animal deserves to die. But in reality, we recognize their equality. We recognize they share the same needs and most importantly, we recognize they share the same feelings. In fact, would anybody argue with this statement? All right, so how do we know? How do we know animals have feelings? Now, how many of you have a cat or dog? Please raise your hand. How do you know your cat or dog has feelings? You do know your cat or dog has feelings, right? How do you know? Keep in mind, I'm giving this presentation in the high school classroom like 99% of the time. I like when an audience engages. Feel free, feel free to shout out. It helps me help you. 
How do you know your animal? How do you know your cat or dog has feelings? They cry, they bark, they purr, they howl, they whimper, they growl. Their movements, they run away when they're scared. They come up to an attention. The dog might wag her tail when she's happy. Put her tail between her legs when she's upset. So their sounds, their movements, and their facial expressions. Listen, they feel. But what about pain? Well, let's do a test. You take your hand, put it over a flame, what happens? Burns, your reaction, you pull back and scream. You take a dog's paw, put it over a flame, what's his reaction? Same thing, pull back and scream. Take a pig's leg, put it over a flame, same reaction. You take a dog, a pig, a cow, a chicken, a goat, a duck, a horse, a rat, a mouse, animals, something put it apart by the flame, they all pull back and scream. You take a fish out of water, what's their reaction? Yeah, they flip-flop. Why do they flip-flop? They can't breathe. You want to know what it feels to be a fish out of water? Have your friend hold your head underwater and not let go. Of course fish have feelings. They're not vegetables, not plants, not fruits. Take a vegetable plant. Let's take a fruit. Take a strawberry. Put it over a flame. What happens? Doesn't have feet to run away. Doesn't have wings to fly away. Doesn't have fins to swim away. Doesn't have a mouth to scream, a nose to smell, two eyes to see, two ears to hear, a heart to beat, a mind to think. And before you say plants have feelings, there is not one plant on this planet that has a central nervous system. Without a central nervous system, broccoli cannot feel pain and happiness the way that animals and humans can. Every animal on this planet is capable of experiencing pain. And just like most human beings, no animal wants to feel pain. No animal wants to die. And yet the funny thing is that we've actually been taught our whole life to love animals, to treat all animals with respect and compassion. I mean, just think about the movies that parents take their kids to see. Do any of these movies look familiar? I know I'm coming from South Florida, but you guys know these movies, right? Okay, good. I went to Norway like about three months ago and I got off the plane and I was like, you know who Charlotte's Web is? You know who Simba is? All right, so you guys know this, right? All right, so. Look, it's funny, because these are all about farmed animals. Even fish are being farmed. These are about the animals we eat. And even though we eat them, we root for them too. Look, you might be having bacon every morning for breakfast, but nobody wants to see Wilbur made the bacon in the Charlotte's Web. Now, I guarantee there are thousands of people watching Chicken Run, rooting for the chicken, saying, go chickens, go, while eating a KFC bucket of chicken wings. How many kids watch the movie Babe, fall in love with Babe, and then go home and then unknowingly serve Babe for dinner by their parents? We're teaching kids to love these animals and eat them too. And this is the closest thing you'll come to see their reality in the matrix, in the story that we've created. But today, we step outside that story. Now, the video I'm about to show you is where 90 to 95% of the meat, dairy, and eggs come from the United States. Now, let me make this very clear to you. I am not showing you the worst. What you're about to see is standard everyday procedure. And if you find it too upsetting, simply put your head down. But if you cannot bear to watch it, maybe you shouldn't be eating it. It's only two minutes, so please don't leave. After the video, we will look at the health and environmental consequences of raising animals for food. The first scene you're going to see in this video is a cow giving birth, all right, on a dairy farm. Pay close attention to what happens to the calf and the mother's reaction. Like I said, two minutes, that's it. Thank you. 
battle for eight hours a day. It's a bloody, violent job, and nobody should have to do it. I don't know what it means that you know we can participate in such cruelty without paying attention to it, without caring about it, without wanting to do different. Citizens want to assume that animals will be treated humanely, that there are laws on the books to prevent cruelty. People are usually surprised to learn there aren't. If people looked at what was happening, they'd be appalled. Most people would not support the type of abuse that you can comment on that response. If you replace the animals in that video with dogs and cats, would you feel any different? And would you do anything to stop it? Now, I've been giving this presentation for over 10 years, and a lot has changed in that time. But the cruelty that we inflict upon cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and fish have remained exactly the same. And we continue to justify it by the story that we've been told. Now, many years ago, people believed that slavery was necessary. And if you try to reason with a slave owner, as I am trying to reason with you today, they would have tried to justify the cruelty they were causing. Now, I know some of you will leave this building and continue to eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. But please, do not for one second think that it is necessary. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Now, every one of you could smoke cigarettes. Do you think that's necessary? Now, you could smoke a pack of cigarettes every day for the rest of your life, and, well, you could live to 100. But what do you put your body at a greater risk of suffering from? Lung cancer, heart disease. Look, you could eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish your entire life, and, well, you could live to 100. But you put your body at a greater risk of suffering from degenerative diseases. You see, these are the leading cause of death and disease in the United States. In fact, pretty much all of North America and Europe. In fact, every 34 seconds, somebody suffers a heart attack. Every 40 seconds, a stroke. And every day, 4,600 people are diagnosed with cancer in the United States. 4,600 every day. Please, raise your hand if you know somebody or knew somebody who has or had cancer. Yeah, that's what I thought. How about somebody who suffered a heart attack? How about somebody with diabetes? Now take a look around. Don't you find this just a little bit disturbing? Which box are you going to fall into? Now have you ever heard of a gorilla in the wild suffering from type 2 diabetes? You ever heard of a tiger suffering from high cholesterol? You ever heard of an obese wildebeest? These animals don't suffer from these diseases because they're eating what's in their best interest. We are not eating what is in our best interest. And yes, I am fully aware that some animals eat other animals. I get that. That's because one, they don't have a choice. Animals don't have a choice. We do. It's not like you're going to find a bunch of tigers sitting in a veg fest talking about how deer have feelings and the benefits of tofu. And two, it is in the best interest for a tiger to hunt, kill, and eat a deer. Once again, it is not in our best interest to eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. And besides, when did the actions of animals, that some animals eat other animals, become a justification for how we should act? It's funny because everybody wants to eat like a caveman, but nobody wants to live in a cave. Oh, and if you're wondering about the circle of life, <laughs> what are you, Simba? This isn't the Lion King. This is a nightmare. 365 days of the year, and you're playing the villain. Yet most people are opposed to animal cruelty. Most people don't want animals to suffer. Yet most people don't want the killing to stop. No, they just want the killing to be done in a nicer way. You know, like kosher, halal, humane slaughter. Humane slaughter. What the hell is that? Is that where you like rub a pig's belly, feed him some milk and cookies, and chop his head off? Because if I did that to one of you, would everybody be like, well, at least he got his milk and cookies. Instead of trying to create a nicer system of killing, 
maybe it's time we stop the system of killing. You know, I know some of you might be thinking, yeah, but if I don't buy the bacon, somebody else will. So what does it matter, right? <laughs> what kind of logic is that? Is that the same logic you apply to the rest of your life? Because I guarantee you when you go to bed tonight, some bad stuff is going to happen. Somebody's going to get shot and somebody's going to get robbed. Does that mean tomorrow morning when you wake up, you're going to be like, oh, man, you know what? I'm going to go rob somebody because it's going to happen no matter what. If you don't agree with murder and theft, don't participate in it. If you don't agree with what you saw in that video, you don't have to participate in it. It's completely unnecessary and unhealthy. So let's take a look what we are participating in, how it affects the animals, our health, and the health of this planet. Now these are battery cages. 95% of the eggs that we consume come from these conditions. A battery cage is literally the size of this piece of paper. Four to five hens be put in a cage this size and have their beaks burned off without any painkillers. Why do they burn their beaks off? Yeah, they become aggressive towards each other in these conditions. They're not naturally aggressive. It'd be like if I took five of you in this room, put you in the corner over there, and sealed it off and kept you there for 48 hours straight. Now, you might be loved ones going in, but I guarantee after 48 hours, you're probably not going to be in the best of terms. So how does the industry solve this problem? Simple. Create a label. Cage free. Free range. Sounds pretty good. Looks pretty good too, right? Well, here's a cage-free farm, Virginia. See, according to the egg industry, this is what freedom looks like. Now, what's your definition of freedom? Does this apply? Cage-free, free-range, it's just a label. It allows us to feel better by participating in, but doesn't mean very much for the animals. What about organic, though? We've all heard that's healthier, right? Well, considering that 80% of all the antibiotics used in the United States are fed to farmed animals, it's got to be healthier, right? Well, for fruits and vegetables, it is. For meat, dairy, eggs, and fish, it ain't. You see, organic simply is to do with the food the animals are fed. No antibiotics, no pesticides, and no added hormones. And I say added hormones because we eat young animals. We eat animals under the age of one. These animals are still growing, meaning they have naturally occurring growth hormones in their body at the time of slaughter. There is no such thing as organic chicken, organic turkey, organic beef, organic pork. Not when you're eating babies. So no added hormones, no antibiotics, no pesticides. Now these are three things you do not want to put in your body. However, organic has very little to do with the condition that the animals are raised in. In fact, this is an organic egg farm Wisconsin. So let me ask you something. Where do these animals go to the bathroom? And where they eat? And where they sleep? They eat, sleep, and defecate all in the same spot. Now does that sound healthy to you? Even on old McDonald's farm, and good luck finding it, all male chicks born in the egg industry are thrown out at birth. The day they are born is the day they die. Why does the egg industry kill all the male chicks? Yeah, they don't produce. They don't lay eggs. They don't fasten the meat. They don't fit in the equation. So they're doing all of this just so that we can eat this. Well, might as well know what it is. What's an egg? What do you put in your body? And please, don't say a baby chick. This is not a baby chick. It's not a fetus or an embryo either. It can't be because it's not fertilized, which is good news because seriously, why would you want to eat an abortion? So what is it? It's an unfertilized egg, which doesn't sound too bad at all, except when you realize that a woman once a month will shed an unfertilized egg if she's not pregnant. What's that called? Congratulations, you're eating a hen's period. It's the unfertilized reproductive cycle of a hen. However, however, this is not a menstruation cycle. It's not a menstruation cycle because, one, there's no blood, and two, they're not mammals, but it is the expulsion of an unfertilized egg, which by any other name is called a period. Yeah, you don't need to eat a hen's period any more than you need to eat a dog's period, a cat's period, or a woman's period. You don't need to eat anybody's period. And any nutritional benefit you get from a hen's period, you can get from a plant without the high cholesterol. You see, your body naturally makes cholesterol. Your body makes all the cholesterol you need. It's the only type of good cholesterol that your body makes. Any cholesterol you bring in from the outside is bad. And there's only one way to get bad cholesterol. Animal products, meat, dairy, eggs, and fish all contain ridiculously high amounts of cholesterol. And when you have high cholesterol, what can that lead to? Heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, and openly death. Remember, too much cholesterol clogs arteries. Clogged arteries leads to lack of blood flow, which leads to a heart attack, or lack of oxygen in the brain, which leads to a stroke. In fact, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. I'm pretty sure it's in Canada. I know it's in uh, Europe as well. So let's not forget, though, that happy cows come from California. But even your happy cows in California are hooked in machines. So when does a cow start producing milk? Anybody know when a cow starts producing milk? 
when she's pregnant, she's got to give birth. She has to have a baby. There's no such thing as a magical cow that will produce milk on command. She is a mammal, and like all mammals, she has to be pregnant to produce milk. So has a cow become pregnant? No sex in the farm. A farmer's not going to wait for a cow and a bull to get on. He's not going to set the mood, light some candles, put on some usher. So how do you get a cow pregnant without the bull? You guys know who usher is? All right, all right good, good. Because I went into a class the other day, and I, again, high school class in, in Florida, and at the end of the presentation, the teacher went up to the one of the students and says, you know, what did you think of the presentation? The kid was like, ah, I thought it was great, except for one thing. And the teacher goes, what was that one thing? And the kid goes, nobody listens to Usher anymore. All right, there you go. You guys listen to Usher. Good, good. All right, so, so how do you get a cow pregnant without the bull? Artificial insemination. See, the crazy thing, if I do this to my female dog, if I were to artificially inseminate my female dog so I could take my dog's milk and put it on my cereal, you would say, what are you out of your freaking mind? Yet when it's done to a cow, it's considered normal. So uh, what's your definition of normal? Okay, now she's pregnant, she gives birth. What happens to her baby? Taken away. All male calves born during stream immediately take of their mother. Chained by the neck to a wooden crate, deprived mother's milk for an inefficient diet, will never be able to turn around, will never see the light of day, and will live like this for 8 to 18 weeks, at which point he'll then be shipped off to slaughter and converted to what we call veal. Veal is just a nice way of saying young, sick, baby male calf. If you are drinking cow's milk, the only reason is because a male calf chained to a box isn't. Why do this to the male calf born in the dairy industry? As opposed to a female, how is a male different? Doesn't produce, just like the male chicks in the egg industry. They don't make any money. But the female, oh, well, she does. And she could be just like her mother, with a constant cycle of artificial impregnation, birth, and milking. But she, too, will be taken away from her mother. Why take the female calf away from her mother? What happens if she stays? What's she going to do? You know, drink the milk. We don't want that, do we? So how do you think the cow feels having her baby torn away from her? Oh, the same way that you would feel if you were to bring babies torn away from you. It is called stress. Stress is the hormone cortisol released throughout the body. These animals are born into a life of stress. You do not pasteurize the stress out. It becomes part of the flesh, part of the meat, and part of the milk. And when you consume their stress hormones, it could have a negative impact upon your body. In particular, hypertension, high blood pressure, which could lead to a stroke, which is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, and again, in, for Canada, I should have done my research. I'm pretty sure a stroke is pretty high up there. Now, after about four to five years, the dairy cow no longer produces enough milk. She becomes unprofitable. What happens to all the unprofitable dairy cows in the dairy industry? If they, don't come, they don't go to Florida. They don't go where... Is there anywhere, like, hot here in Canada? <laughs> no, probably not. Okay, so they're not going to go to Florida to retire. They're going to get shipped off to slaughter and convert to hamburger meat. You ever wonder why it costs 99 cents for a hamburger McDonald's? It's because it's coming the most sick, abused animal on the planet. Animals too sick to even stand up. You pay for what you get. And just so we're clear, cows are producing 10 times the amount of milk they produce in nature. They're hooked to the machines two to three times a day. These machines, like udders, cause bruising, swelling, and lacerations, cuts. The machine cannot tell the difference between milk and blood. That means that every glass of milk that you drink, even after it's pasteurized, because remember, pasteurization is not a removal process, it is a cooking sanitation process. So every glass of milk that you drink contains a little bit of blood and a little bit of pus. You know what pus is, right? Pus is when you have a pimp when you pop nasty white stuff that comes out. That's what's in your milk and cheese. Bon appetit. Now, biologically speaking, okay, biologically speaking, in nature, who is a cow producing milk for? Yeah, her calf, her baby, her young. Not for us. Just like when your mom was pregnant with you, who was she producing milk for? For you. Not for your daddy, not for the neighbor, not for the mailman, not for the dog, and not for the cat. Now, if your daddy was drinking your mother's milk, mother's pregnant with you, well, then your daddy was stealing your milk. If you're drinking cow's milk, you're stealing his milk. You see, what do all these animals get the milk from? They're mothers. We are the only species on this planet that take the milk from another animal. And if you don't think that's weird, if I brought a pregnant dog into the room right now, how many of you would be like, okay, maybe just a little? And when did these animals stop consuming milk? After infancy. We're the only species on this planet that can continue drinking milk into adulthood. If you really don't think it's weird to be drinking milk at your age and older, think about this. If I brought a pregnant woman onto the stage right now, how many of you would be like, hey, can I have some of your milk? Yeah, don't, 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 don't do that. If you walk into Publix, actually, I'm going to say Publix. If you walk into a supermarket, what supermarket? Can you give me a name of a supermarket that's famous here? What is it? Loblaws? Loblaws. Loblaws. All right. 
All right, I'm going to totally forget that. So I'm just going to say, let's walk into any supermarket anywhere here in Ontario. And you come to a milk aisle, pick up a milk carton. Instead of a happy cartoon cow on the cover, there's a picture of a happy cartoon chimpanzee. What you're holding in your hand right now is chimp milk. On sale, two for one. What do you think? Now, why would it be nasty and disgusting to take the milk from this animal and not nasty and disgusting to take the milk from this animal? Because you've been told a story. But you know what? If you're drinking cow's milk and you can find yourself some chimp milk, I say make the switch. As disgusting as it is, it actually makes more sense for human beings to take the milk from a chimp than a cow. Why might that be? Yeah, I don't know. They share about 98% of our DNA. If you're going to take the milk from any animal, wouldn't you want to take animals closest to us? Last I checked, we don't look anything like a cow. You see, a calf at birth weighs 90 pounds. A baby, on average, weighs about 7 pounds. A calf weighs 90 pounds. That calf grew to 500 pounds in nine months. They can put on 410 pounds in under a year. Man, there's only one product in nature that can make an animal grow that fast. What's that? Hormones, and that's what milk is. Milk is composed of natural growing growth hormones. And if you're thinking of drinking organic milk, not getting those growth hormones, think again. This is organic milk. It doesn't say no hormones. It says no added hormones. It'd be like if I said to you, I got some rock candy with no added sugar. Rock candy is sugar. Milk is a growth hormone. And this growth hormone is meant for one animal and one animal only, a cow. You have to understand milk is specific to every individual species. Here's what I mean. A cow grew to 2,000 pounds in two years because they drink the mother's milk. Cow milk growth hormones meant for baby calf as an infant. Why put growth hormones meant for a 2,000 pound animal into this? Logically speaking, it's illogical. In fact, you know what happens when you start putting too many growth hormones in your body? You grow abnormally. Here's what I mean. 40, 50 years ago, girls would start their menstruation cycle, have their first period at the age of 16, 15, or 14. Today, girls have their first period at the age of 12, 11, and 10. That means a 10-year-old can get pregnant, give birth, and be a mother at the age of 10. Does that sound healthy or natural to you? Look, when your body develops faster than nature intended, you are making your body more susceptible to diseases, in particular cancer. For women, breast cancer, ovarian cancer is on the rise and happening in younger women. And for men, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and testicular cancer is on the rise and happening in younger men. In fact, when you think about it, cancer is simply an abnormal growth of cells. Now, you actually have cancer cells in your body right now. That's normal. What's not normal is when those cells multiply rapidly uncontrollably. There has to be a trigger. We know that smoking cigarettes is a trigger. Here is another trigger. Because the more growth hormones you put in your body, the more likely your cells will grow abnormally. It's funny though, because everybody wants to find the cure. Walk for the cure, run for the cure, bike for the cure, swim for the cure, dance for the cure, hell, and they can even take a shit for the cure. Yet nobody wants to know the cause. If you find the cure, it doesn't eliminate the cause. Look, you got to understand cancer is a billion dollar industry. People are getting rich off of the sickness and disease of others. This pink ribbon BS has been placed over our eyes to blind us from looking at the cause. Instead, we pray and give money to people to find a cure. Yet one third of all cancers are diet related. It's funny though, because I hear a lot of people say, but cancer runs my family. Heart disease runs my family. Diabetes runs my family. No, you know what runs in your family? Meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. You know the definition of insanity, right? Repeating the same behavior again and again and expecting a different result. So how do you adjust the phonological act? You create a story. And every story has an author. Who is the author of this story? Who came up with this quote? The milk industry, the dairy council. And what's the ultimate goal of the dairy council? Is this about your health or is it about money? Because what if I ever say to you, there's a new story going around. Bacon, it does a body good. Would you believe that? Look, nobody's eating bacon for health reasons. Nobody goes on a bacon diet. It doesn't do a body good. In fact, the World Health Organization classifies processed meat, such as bacon, as a carcinogen, meaning it can cause cancer. So why does bacon do your body bad? What's it high in? Saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, and nitrates. Well, guess what? Milk and cheese is loaded with saturated fat, and loaded with cholesterol. In fact, how many glasses of milk does the dairy industry, as well as your government and my government, how much do they tell us to drink? By the way, both governments, highly influenced by the dairy industry. So if you go to the US, you're supposed to drink two to three glasses of milk every day. Now, if you were to follow the government's advice and drink three glasses of 2% milk, not whole milk, three glasses of 2% milk have the same amount of cholesterol as 15 slices of bacon. If I said you need to eat 15 slices of bacon every day for the rest of your life to be healthy, would you believe that?
If milk does about a good, why would 65% of the human population be lactose intolerant? 65%? That means two every three people on this planet, when they drink milk or eat cheese, and what is cheese? Just spoiled rotten milk. They suffer one of these symptoms. Diarrhea, stomach ache, gasness, bloated, cramps, ear infection, excess mucus. If you suffer many of these symptoms when you drink milk, eat cheese, congratulations, you're normal. It is normal to be lactose intolerant. Here's the reason why. All mammals, and human beings are mammals, have an enzyme known as lactase, put an A right there. That enzyme breaks down the sugar, known as lactose. However, as all mammals mature, including human beings, we lose that enzyme. That's why you don't see dogs nursing on their mother after infancy, cats nursing on their mother after infancy. This is why you're not gonna go home and nurse on your mother or some other woman, because you're not an infant, and it would be freaking disgusting. But hey, it must be good for kids, right? Because every school I've been to, you could be guaranteed that cow's milk will be served in the cafeteria. Yet cow's milk is one of the most common food allergies among infant children. So how do you adjust the phonological act? Oh, right, the story. What's in cow's milk that builds strong bones? Calcium, but just as important as calcium for strong bones, is exercise. I mean, think about it. If all you do all day is consume calcium, but sit in your couch, but consume calcium, but sit in your couch, are you going to have strong bones? Of course not. You've got to exercise with your running, jogging, jump ropes, push-ups, pull-ups, work activities, playing a sport, doing yoga. You have to exercise. Also important for strong bones, vitamin D. Vitamin D is added to cow's milk. You know the original source of vitamin D? The sun. And it's free. Now, in South Florida, that's not a problem. Here, it seems like it sucks. But whatever. You'll get it some other way. Move to Florida. You won't have any problem. Plus, the, the presentation would make a hell of a lot more sense. All right. Now, look. Um, so vitamin D, which again, the sun, and if you can't get it from that, you can get it from other fortified foods that don't come from cow's milk. Um, vitamin D, exercise, and calcium are important for strong bones. But my question for you is, is this the best source of calcium for human beings? Well, let's find out. Countries that drink the, uh, the most milk. Anybody want to take a guess? United States, England, Canada, no, Canada would be on the list, I'm sorry, I just, I'm lazy, all right? United States, England, Sweden, Finland, Canada. It's funny, whenever I go to a high school classroom in South Florida, some kid always screams out Florida. Oh, there you go, there's the state of education in the United States. Anybody know what osteoporosis is? Since I can't hear you, I'm just going to say it myself. It is literally weak bones, loss of bone density, degeneration bones, brittle bones. Remember, you've been taught, drink cow's milk, get strong bones. What country do you have the highest rate of weak bones? By the way, Canada and Florida would also be on that list. Well, that sucks, because I thought this was supposed to do the trick. I thought all we do is drink a glass of cow's milk to get strong bones. It's funny how that's where we're taught, yet why does every supermarket sell calcium supplements? <laughs> no, seriously. Why would we need calcium supplements when we can't even go a day without eating cheese? If milk does a body good, why would 53 million Americans either suffer from osteoporosis or be at high risk of getting it? 53 million? I thought this is supposed to do the trick. The thing is, that's all it is. It's just a trick. In fact, the Harvard University study that followed 75,000 women for 12 years showed the increased intake of calcium dairy products did not lower the risk of osteoporosis. This is not a random coincidence. There's more to it. And the more to it is this. A diet that is high in animal protein can cause the body to excrete more calcium and normal through the kidneys. You see the protein found in meat, dairy, eggs, and fish contain amino acids that are high in sulfur that our bodies just can't break down the way that real omnivores and real carnivores can. Look, the human body is much better equipped to handle plant protein instead of animal protein. Now you combine this with a lack of exercise, a lack of vitamin D, smoking cigarettes, and a diet high in sodium, alcohol, caffeine, and soda, and you have a recipe for weak bones. So what about your cereal? Problem solved, get the milk from the plant. Soy milk, rice milk, hemp milk, oat milk, flax milk, cash milk, coconut milk, and my personal favorite, almond milk. They even have hazelnut milk. They also have pea milk, which is like the worst name for a milk, but it's from peas, not actual like urine. So they got pea milk on the market as well. I just like saying pea milk a lot. All right, now look, I don't know what you actually you sell here in, 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 uh, in Ontario, in London, but, um, but I'm sure the, 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 the name of the company might not be the same, 
but the actual plant is probably the same, right? So soy milk and coconut milk and almond milk and cashew milk. Now, the great thing about these uh, products is that they all contain the exact amount of calcium as cow's milk, 150 milligrams per half a glass. So what's the difference? There is no side effects, no blood, no pus, no cholesterol, little to no saturated fat, no animal growth hormones, no stress hormones, and it's plant protein instead of animal protein. It is a win-win situation. No animal has to suffer or die for your appetite or your health. Now, this is all well and good for your cereal, but to be honest, if you want calcium, go directly to the source. Fruits and vegetables like dark leafy greens, collard greens, broccoli, kale, nuts, seeds, and beans are loaded with calcium. And the dark leafy greens and beans are also loaded with iron. In fact, who is the largest, strongest land animal on earth? Largest land animal. Elephant, very good. I go into schools and kids always say, dinosaur. You know what? The other day, I got to tell you this. This might be highly inappropriate. But anyway, so the other day, I'm in a school in Miami, and, and I'm talking about almond milk. And this girl is like, almond milk? But almonds don't have titties. It's, just, it's true. They don't. Not yet. All right. So what does the elephant's diet consist of? Plants. You're going to tell an elephant to start drinking cow's milk for strong bones? He gets all his cows from the plants. Now, these plants look healthy. Well, let, let me tell you what's not healthy. 68% of all diseases are diet-related. That's a government statistic in the U.S., but again, I, look, I'm, besides, besides, you know, our president, there's really not much different from you and I, all right? 68% um, of all diseases are diet-related, all right? That's a government statistic. Now, I got good news, I got bad news. So normally, if I'm talking in like a, you know, in a high school classroom, that means that three to five of those kids might fall into this category, might fall into this statistic. The good news, actually, that's the bad news. The good news is 68% of all diseases are preventable. Is the 68% of all diseases coming from the image on the left or the right? You ever heard of somebody suffering a heart attack because they had too many oranges, sweet potatoes, and broccoli? What clogs arteries? Cholesterol. You don't get that cholesterol from the plants. All that cholesterol from the meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. And you get no fiber, not one ounce of fiber from any meat, dairy, egg, or fish product. And what is fiber good for? Going to the bathroom, you have trouble doing it, eat some more plants. Fiber is only found in plants. And you get no complex carbohydrates from the animal product. You need complex carbohydrates for energies, which your body runs on. It's the original fuel for your brain. Complex carbohydrates only found in plants, like root vegetables, beans, peas, lentils, whole grains. However, not all carbohydrates are created equal. You want complex carbohydrates, and you want to avoid simple, refined carbohydrates. Let me give you some examples of simple, refined carbohydrates. White flour, white sugar, white bread. If it's white, it ain't right. Once you go black, can't go back. I do that in like an all-white school, and the kids are like, what the hell is he talking about? All-black school, they start high-fiving each other. Coca-Cola is the devil. Look, our diets are way too high in sugar and way too high in sodium. So without a doubt, this is definitely part of the 68% of all diseases. And look, as much as I despise these corporations, at least they're not coming out and saying, it does a body good. Because that's exactly what the meat, dairy, egg, and fish industries are doing. You see, we live in a culture that feeds off of sickness, disease, and ignorance. Let me prove it to you. When you watch TV, and I'm assuming that you guys watch TV and that you have the same commercials as we do. So when you watch TV, what commercials do you see for food? Give me some of the commercials. All right, you got cereal commercials, but like you got names of cereals. I right, have about this? I'm just going to run it down because uh, hopefully you'll have them. You have McDonald's. We call it McDevils. Murder King, Domino's, Pizza Hut, Papa John's, Red Lobster, Alpac Steakhouse, Chili's, Arby's, Sonic. All right, so they all have all these commercials for fast food. What do they all try to sell you? Meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. It's not like you're seeing commercials for broccoli, cauliflower, and sprayer gang tofu. No, it's meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. And then what commercials do you see in between the meat, dairy, eggs, and fish? You need some Pepto-Bismol? How about some Rolaids? Maybe some Tums. You got heartburn? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Metamucil? I have some fiber, can no fiber diet? Can't, 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 can't take a crap? Got no fiber? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Citricals, some Caltrade? You got weak bones, osteoporosis? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Weight Watchers, Abigenic Craig, diet pills, overweight? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Lipitor, Abbas Crestor, maybe some Avipro, you got high blood pressure, high cholesterol? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Levitra, Abbas Viagra, can't get it up? Don't worry, we got you covered. And I don't know about you, but after these pill commercials, what comes next? Is your erection lasting longer than four hours? Can't get it down? Call Johnson & Johnson attorney. We got you covered. Everybody's profiting off of this sickness, disease, and ignorance. It's funny how all the foods that we're told we're supposed to eat now comes its own pill. So how do you adjust the phenological act? Oh, right, the story. Look, there's over 11 million vegetarians in the United States. In Canada, I don't know the numbers. I slacked off. I forgot to do my research. But in the United States, it's about 11 million people, all right? Have you ever heard of vegetarian going to the hospital for lack of protein? It, it is unheard of. In fact, the World Health Organization says all oh, you need about 40, 60 grams of protein per day. Now, if you're an athlete, 
You can double, triple, quadruple that, but please let me show you how easy it is to get 40, 60 grams of protein without eating meat, dairy, eggs, or fish. You take an avocado, can of garbanzo beans, chickpeas, broccoli, and tomato, a very healthy, nutritious, inexpensive meal. This meal is dirt cheap, and you got over 25 grams of protein. Just like that, you're halfway there. A peanut butter jelly sandwich on whole wheat bread with a glass of soy milk has about 20 grams of protein. One can, okay, one can of kidney beans has 24 grams of protein. Now, I am not a big fan of buying canned foods, but I do want to show you how ridiculously easy and cheap it is to get protein. One cup of almonds, 28 grams of protein. Everything you see up here is composed of protein. As long as you get enough calories, you'll get enough protein. And as long as you eat food and people have no problem eating, you'll get enough protein. In fact, you can get every essential amino acid from plants. But I do have a confession. I love chicken. I love chicken, but the chicken I does not come from a dead carcass of a chicken. No, mine comes from a plant. It's called veggie chicken. However, it looks and tastes the same as the chicken you eat. The reason why is because they smoke it, cook it, grill it, fry it, bake it, and put the same spices, herbs, and seasoning that you put on dead chickens to make dead chickens taste good. Look, you're not eating meat for flavor. You're eating meat for texture. If you think you're eating meat for flavor, go outside, find yourself a squirrel, and eat them. You guys have squirrels here, right? All right, good, good. All right, don't eat squirrels. All right. Now, look, look, look. If you can put a man or woman on the moon, seriously, how hard is it to make a plant taste like a chicken? It's really not that hard. This will fool even the biggest meat eater. Do you guys sell this here? Gardein? All right, good, good. Hey, all right, good. We got something in common. All right, so each box is 44 grams of protein. There's more protein in the veggie chicken than actual chicken. Let me give you one more example. You guys have cliff bars here? Yes. All right, good. I'm two for two. All right. Cliff Bar, granola bar, myth on the plant tastes great, about the size it's remote. In our supermarkets in South Florida, it costs $1.50. You spend $3, I don't know, again, foreign currency, well, not foreign currency, but the Canadian currency, I don't know what the hell that equals to. But anyway, it's not that expensive, and you basically get 20 grams of protein. So if you had two of them, you would be pretty much be set for your protein for the day. You don't need to work getting enough. You'll get enough. The problem is getting too much. The average, the average American is getting over 100 grams of protein per day. Double we're supposed to be getting. That is why 30% of children and 65% of adults consider over the United States. We have one of the highest rates of obesity in the entire world, and yet we continue to talk about protein like we've got some kind of deficiency. Oh, yes, there's most definitely a problem with protein in the U.S. We're getting far too much of it. And yes, I know I'm a skinny white guy telling about protein that I meat, but these guys aren't skinny, and they don't get enough protein. None of these guys eat meat. They're all vegetarians. So please, do not tell me you need to eat dead animals to excel at life because these guys do just fine without it. If you don't think you can gain muscle mass on a plant-based diet, <laughs> maybe talk to these guys. The largest, strongest land animals on earth are all vegetarians, and the vegetarians live the longest. Go figure. Now think of your body as a car. You've got to put the right fuel in to get the work proper. Don't put the right fuel, it ain't going to work. And if you don't take proper care of your car, it's not going to last as long. If you don't take proper care of your body, it's not going to last as long. This is the right fuel for your body. Where do you think animals get their source of protein, calcium, iron, vitamins, and minerals? They get it from the plants. And then other animals eat those animals that got it from the plants. When you eat animals, you're in the secondary source. Look, the higher up you go the food chain, the more energy you lose. It's just not efficient to be on top. In fact, let me show you how inefficient and idiotic our diet actually is. Let's take black beans and broccoli. It's healthy. Nutritious, inexpensive, it's dirt cheap, and it provides you with protein, calcium, and iron. But instead of eating the black beans and broccoli directly to get the protein, calcium, and iron, you're going to feed the black beans and broccoli to me, so I get the protein, calcium, and iron. And then what are you going to do? Kill me, cook me, and eat me. Cut the middleman out. Why are you filtering your nutrients through somebody else's body? Go directly to the source. Because as long as you eat a variety of these plant-based foods, you get every vitamin, mineral, nutrient need. You get everything, everything but the side effects of meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. You eliminate all the high cholesterol, the high saturated fat, all the animal growth hormones, stress hormones, and all the ridiculously high amounts of animal protein. Instead, you get plant protein, which keeps the body in homeostasis. Now, if you don't like pyramids, if you're anti-pyramid, if you got something against pyramids, here's a plate. Right fuel for the body, wrong fuel for the body, according to our anatomy. Although we are omnivorous in our ability to eat both plants and animals, we, however, look nothing like omnivores or carnivores. Do you realize that physiologically our anatomy is almost 100% identical to our brother from another mother? We look like herbivores. How so? Our teeth. Yes, I know you have canine teeth. Congratulations. Most herbivores on this planet have canine teeth. If you think your canine teeth are sharp, particularly cat or dog, they have Fangs meant to rip through flesh. Ours are pretty dome flat compared to theirs. Plus, we have more teeth like all herbal on this planet because we chew our food. Those of you who have a cat or dog, when you feed them, what do they do? Yeah, swallow, limit, and chew. In fact, real omnivores, real carnivore, their jaw opens up. You 
chewing gum right now, you know what I'm talking about. If we were meant to be on top of the food chain, don't you think we'd have some claws to rip through flesh? In fact, if I brought a pig into the room right now and asked you to kill the pig with your claws, the pig would probably enjoy it more than anything else. And just because we can create weapons like bow and arrows, knives, and guns, how does that change your anatomy, especially your intestines? You see, our digestive tract, like all herbivores on the planet, are really long. Real omnivores, real carnivores, their digestive tract is much shorter in length. So whose food travels out faster? Simba's, which is good, because you can call it bacon as much as you want. Once in your body, it's no longer bacon. It's a dead animal. It's decomposing flesh. It's a rotting corpse. It is bacteria. And because omnivores, carnivores have 10 times rise of chloric acid, they can break the bacteria down. And because their intestines are shorter in length, they can crap it out faster. That is why you will never, ever, 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 ever hear of Simba suffering from high cholesterol. Now, I cannot leave without talking about fish. What do these two things have in common? You ever take temperature thermometer, break it open, drink liquid? Of course not. Every time you eat fish, you're doing you know, that exact same thing. We've polluted the ocean to such a great extent that BP oil spill and that nuclear disaster in Japan, just because we don't talk about it anymore, doesn't mean it went away. We've polluted the ocean to such a great extent there's a warning label on fish. Nearly all fish and seafood have some amount of mercury, chemicals known to cause cancer, birth defects, and reproductive harm. Pregnant nursing women, women who have become pregnant, and young children, not the following f food, including fish, uh, including tuna. What else does the government tell women not to consume when they're pregnant. Three things. Alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs. So basically, I've been saying, hey, look, if you think about being pregnant, lay off the alcohol, lay off the cigarettes, lay off the drugs, oh, and stop eating fish. If fish can cause a woman's body and the child's body this much harm, why would anybody want to eat it? The omega-3, the brain food in fish, gets canceled out by the mercury poisoning and the high cholesterol. You get omega-3 omega, uh, from, omega from flax seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts, plants, without the cholesterol, without the mercury poisoning. Oh, and speaking of pollution, I don't know if you noticed in that video, but there was tons of... You see, when you raise 9 billion cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, or food, it generates a lot of waste. In fact, animal agriculture produces 130 times more excrement than the entire U.S. population. That is a lot of... So where's it all going? Our rivers and streams. Animal agriculture is leading cause of blue river streams in the United States. The meat and dairy industries are using our rivers and streams as a toilet. And no, that is not chocolate. And it's not just affecting our water supply and our soil, it's affecting the air as well. You see, all this waste generates lots of gases. In particular, methane, which is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. In fact, raising animals' food generates more greenhouse gases than all the cars, planes, ships, and trains in the world combined. Oh, and let's not forget that animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. You see, raising animals for food is completely unsustainable and a complete waste of resources. It takes more land, more water, and more crops to raise animals for food than to just grow plants directly for human consumption. In fact, 70% of the grain grown in the United States fed to farmed animals instead of people. 80% of the corn grown in the United States consumed by livestock, poultry, and fish. We're feeding corn to fish. And over 30 million tons of soybean meal is consumed by livestock in the United States. 30 million tons! So if you have an irrational fear of soy, I suggest you stop eating animals because most of the soy grown in the United States is fed to farmed animals. So all of this soy, corn, and grain be grown to feed animals instead of people, and yet for some reason, every 3.6 seconds, someone dies of starvation. One, two, three. Something is seriously screwed up with the story that we've been told. Some stories are just not worth repeating. It is time for a new story, a story based upon health and compassion. And that story begins with you. It begins what you eat. That's the big question, James. What the hell do you eat? Look, you're not going to see me on my hands and knees trawling grass at the end of this presentation. I eat everything you eat. There's no sacrifice. The sacrifice is only meat, eggs, and fish. I was sacrificing the animal's life, my health, and the health of this planet. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but it's more expensive though, right? Well, first off, I don't mind spectra dollar on my almond milk if it's healthier for me, and it is. I'm saving money in the long run, less medical bills in the future. But you also remember it's about supply and demand. As demand goes up, the price goes down. That's why soy milk is just cheap as cow's milk. There's a higher demand, and so now there's a lower price. But I do find it funny how everybody seems to be so concerned about the price of organic fruits and vegetables, yet they have no problem dropping 150 in a pair of Air Jordans. People are more concerned with what they wear in their body than what they put in their body. But I got good news. If you actually give a damn about your health, the healthiest food on the planet is the cheapest food on the planet. You want organic, non-GMO, pesticide-free fruits and vegetables that are dirt cheap? 
Grow your own. Now, this will make no sense, but coming from South Florida, you're growing mango tree, papaya tree, avocado tree, banana tree, orange tree, lemon tree, coconut tree. Grow your own tomatoes, herbs, and spices. I just wanted to show off my speed. That's all. But look, you can go to, you can go to farmer's markets. You can go to the supermarket, buy organic frozen vegetables. They tend to be fresher. They pick them when it's ripe. Look, beans, peas, lentils, brown rice, oatmeal, quinoa, nuts, and seeds are the healthiest and cheapest food on the planet. You do not have to spend a lot of money to be healthy. Now, that's what I to call transition food. Keyword, transition. This will help you replace the meat dairy, eggs, and fish. And even though this is processed food, which is obviously not as healthy as this, it is still healthier than eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. So even if you can't get off the transition food, it's still healthier. Why? It has no cholesterol, little to no saturated fat, no animal growth hormones, no stress hormones, and it's plant protein instead of animal protein. Win-win situation. 85%, see, here's, here's where like, I get my, my, uh, my presentation in, New, in the United States all confused. I'm not going to tell you where these, where these come from because I have no idea if you get these or not, but let me just go down the list. Let's go shopping. Instead of dairy, hopefully you can find some of these. Soy butter instead of cow butter tastes exactly the same. Oh, except there's no blood, no pus, no cholesterol, no one will suffer and die. Coconut milk yogurt instead of cow milk yogurt. Non-dairy cream cheese to put in your bagel. Non-dairy ranch dressed per salad. They have enough egg-free mayonnaise. Dairy-free cheese, about a half a dozen in the market. Find the ones you like. My personal favorites, day of cheese and follow your heart. It goes great in grilled cheese sandwich, nachos, and pizza. Dairy-free ice cream, hands down the best ice cream in the world. Coconut milk cookie dough ice cream. Now, if you don't like coconut, don't worry, because it's got soy milk ice cream, almond milk ice cream, rice milk ice cream, cashew milk ice cream. I got five alternatives to one. Even Breyers, haagen you got these? Good, all right, Breyers, haagen and Ben and Jerry's. You got Ben and Jerry's? Good, Ben and Jerry's all have dairy-free ice cream. They're using non, they're using cow, uh, you're using almond milk instead of cow's milk. Just look for the non-dairy words in the bottom. Instead of poultry, they got chicken-free chicken strips. They got veggie barbecue wings. They have veggie turkey for Thanksgiving. In fact, my Thanksgiving looked like no meat, no dairy, no eggs were used. No animal had to suffer or die from my appetite, not even on Thanksgiving. Instead of beef, veggie burgers. There are dozens in the market. Find the ones you like. Don't buy the ones you don't like. If you like the taste of a Whopper, definitely check out the Beyond Meat Burger. I believe it's being sold here today. This burger looks like meat, smells like meat, tastes like meat, but it's made from plants. It's by far the greatest veggie burger to be put on the market. It's made from pea protein, so it's also soy-free and gluten-free. It's got less. It's got no cholesterol. It's got less saturated fat. It's just like a win-win situation. And you can get it pretty much at any supermarket. You guys have TGI fries or burger fry here? No, all right, so then forget that. All right, uh, Gardein. You guys have Gardein. Look for Gardein. Gardein has over two dozen products in the market. Every supermarket sells Gardein. Just look in the freezer section. And uh, some, some supermarkets sell two for one sales. They got veggie chicken, veggie turkey, veggie beef, veggie pork. They have been veggie fish products. Instead of pork, they got veggie riblets, veggie dogs, veggie bacon. They have veggie pepperoni, going dairy free cheese pizza. And instead of fish, they got veggie tuna, veggie crab, veggie shrimp, and veggie fish filet. So instead of being a sea animal, I'm eating a sea vegetable. Now, if you're looking for these products, look for the word vegan, look for the vegan symbol, or simply read the ingredients. A vegan is somebody that chooses not to eat any animal products. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no fish, nothing that comes from an animal, all right, this is different vegetarian, a vegetarian still has dairy and eggs. Before we say it's hard to be vegan, half your diet is already vegan, fruits and vegetables, rice and beans, pasta, spaghetti, nuts, seeds, baked potato, pure much sandwich, corn, the cob, is all vegan. In fact, everything you see up here is vegan. You guys know these foods? Uh, yeah, it's all crap, okay? Even though it's vegan, it's crap. In fact, this, if this is what your diet looks like, you're going to die. This is terrible food. Let me show you some healthier vegan food. Scrambled tofu instead of scrambled hen periods for breakfast. I do recommend you go out and get some food out here. Vegan waffles with soy butter and maple syrup. Fruit salad. Spaghetti with marinara sauce. Nachos, vegan cheese, vegan sour cream, guacamole and salsa. Vegan cheese in the pizza. That's the Beyond Meat Burger. Now, remember, when you have a veggie dog, it's all about the condiment spice herbs seeds you put on it. Now, it's real easy to bake without any eggs. You can use egg replaces, bananas, applesauce, dates, even a vegan egg on the market. I believe the woman who was before me was showing you. They got vegan chocolate chips going to your vegan cookie. And this is coconut milk ice cream on a vegan brown with maple syrup on the top. And I got some more good news. You can still go to your crappy restaurants. All these restaurants have vegan options. Do you guys have these restaurants? All right, Denny's. Denny's is a veggie burger. I can't believe I'm saying this. Denny's is something good. Starbucks is soy milk, almond milk, and coconut milk. Ba Blaze Pizza offers vegan cheese to replace the cow cheese in the pizza. Toxic Hell has a seven-layer bean burrito. Just make it five layers. Get rid of the blood and the pus. No dairy, no sour cream, no cheese. Lump on the rice, beans, guacamole, and salsa. Subway is a veggie sub. It's called the Veggie Delight. Makes your ass with Italian bread. Also, ask avocado. Say no cheese, no mayo. Use mustard. Lump on the veggies. Do you guys have Chipotle? 
All right, good, because Chipotle, you can get a vegan burrito to go through E. coli. It's called sofritas. They use tofu, merit taste, and texture of chicken. And Olive Garden, oh, man, Olive Garden, one step above a Denny's. But if you like Olive Garden, they got spaghetti, pasta, penne with tomato sauce is vegan. Their minestrone soup is vegan. And their unlimited breadsticks are actually vegan. Now, it's funny. Even after all this, I still hear a lot of people say, mm, I don't know, James. It sounds pretty difficult to be vegan. No, it's not difficult to be vegan. You know what's difficult? Climbing Mount Everest, okay? That's difficult. Going to the supermarket and buying almond milk instead of cow's milk is not difficult. In fact, let me show you how easy it can be. For breakfast, let's take a bagel, some vegan dairy-free cream cheese, oatmeal, almond milk, and some fruit. Healthy, nutritious, inexpensive. For lunch, we got two slices of whole wheat bread, some veginase, egg-free mayonnaise out of this world, two slices of tomato, lettuce, veggie bacon, sweet potato fries, BLT that's cruelty-free, cholesterol-free. And for dinner, we got pasta with marinara sauce, meatless meatballs by Gardein. They have a vegan dairy-free Parmesan cheese, but on top, add a salad and some Italian dressing. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no animal to suffer or die for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Now, if you try to go vegan, let's say you go vegan for a month, a week, or even just a day, and then you slip up, you eat some chicken, it's not the end of the world. Well, it's for the chicken. But it doesn't mean you can't try again. Look, I don't know why, but for some reason, people think that vegan is like a one and done deal. Like, whoo, I tried it once. Look, if you try to go vegan, you had to have a reason. Nobody does anything for no reason. So my guess is you probably care about animals. Most people do. You probably care about your health. Most people do. You might care about the environment. Some people do. So it's okay to slip up, but to not try again, what does that mean? You don't care about animals anymore, you don't care about your health anymore, you don't care about the environment anymore. It's okay to slip up, just don't give up. Practice makes perfect. Focus on the reasons why you're doing it, make the transition that much easier. Because look, even if you only go vegan for one meal a day or one day of the week, it's better than not going vegan at all. Because every meal that you go vegan, you make a difference. You make a difference for the animals, for your health, the environment, and you inspire others to make that difference as well. When you leave this room today, you have that opportunity to make a difference. Now, I, I'm totally out of time, but I do want to leave you on a happy note. I want to show you one really quick last video um, of a cow that escaped the slaughterhouse. But before I do that, are there any questions? Because otherwise I won't be able to do the video. I, I, it doesn't really matter to me. I mean, let me show the video. And then maybe if there's time, we can do questions after that. This is Maxine, true story, jumped over a fence.
every time, every time you sit down for a meal, you make a choice. And it is my hope that you choose a healthy and compassionate one. My email is on the screen, so if you have any questions later on, please feel free to email me, james at arff.org. Any questions, thoughts, comments, arguments before I stop talking? All right. It's like a, like a high school classroom. All right. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about fiber. Um, for a long time, I thought all fiber is good to just flush your system out. But uh, recently on the radio, I heard uh, a scientist talking about microbes and how important microbes are to our digestive system. Microbes live on fiber, and if we don't have proper fiber in our diet, we don't have a proper environment for these microbes to live. So that's another good reason to have lots of fiber. There we go. And a fiber, again, only found in plants, not animals. Thank you.
test. That we need to announce, like sponsors or anything. Okay. We might say a couple things at the very end. Okay. Dust. Hello, hello. We have one speaker left, but I, I just want to make uh, one quick announcement. Um, for anybody that, that isn't aware, uh, a fellow activist, Jenny McQueen, was recently arrested for saving a dying baby pig. And Jenny's actually in the audience right here. I know we're not trying to draw too much attention to her, but um, there is a legal defense fund, so if you want to take a look online and, and, and donate to that, because um, rescuing a baby from certain death uh, really shouldn't be a, a criminal offense in this country. Holding. It's not even mine. <laughs> okay, so we have our fifth and final speaker of the day here at the beach stage for the carrot stage. They're going to go all the way till 6 p.m. This is when the event ends. And the last speaker is Amanda Barker standing right here next to me. <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, who brought a crowd? <laughs> 